of education initiatives, and I'm delighted uh, to have the uh, opportunity to speak with a couple folks from the uh, Exploratorium in, in San Francisco and uh, tonight, to, uh, depending on where you are geographically. And uh, also, so on the line also with me is my colleague Liam, who is here from uh, Makey Makey, and he is our community manager. So uh, Liam, if you would, uh, let tell people how they can uh, engage with us in this live conversation. Sure. Hey, everybody, uh, you can uh, tweet us at, at Makey Makey, and we'll answer your questions there. Or you can use the Q&A app, which is on the event page, which if you look down in the YouTube description, there should be a link um, <clears throat> that leads to the event page. And there you can just ask your questions, and we'll come right up on the screen here. Awesome. All right. So uh, if you could, uh, is, is the camera on me, Liam? Yeah, it is right now. <laughs> a bit of it. <laughs> and now it's on Ryan and Nicole. All right. Well, let me do a quick introduction. It looks like it's from my end, it's still on you, but I could be wrong there. Okay. Um, Bear with us, Internet. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so I'd like to introduce Ryan Jenkins and Nicole uh, Cat Catret. Did, did I? Catret. Hey, yay! <laughs> uh, that's actually the first time I've pronounced Nicole's last name. So um, Ryan and Nicole work at uh, what I'm told is one of the most amazing science museums. Am I correct in saying that it's a science museum? Um, art, science, and human perception. Oh, wow. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I was actually, I had the pleasure of leading a, a teacher workshop last, uh, this past Saturday, and uh, I mentioned this event, and one of the teachers that happened to be here in North Carolina at a workshop had been to your, to, to the Exploratorium and was just blown away, said it's, it's uh, the place to be. So, um, and, and we're, I've asked Ryan and Nicole to join us today because they are, um, from a, a previous conversation, a previous Google Hangout, uh, are experts in the world of tinkering, and they're going to tell us more about their work, and also about using the Makey Makey. And uh, they have led workshops for kids and adults and professionals uh, around using the Makey Makey and many other things. And uh, this is also the place, if you're familiar with this book, uh, the, the Art of Tinkering. This is from uh, their, uh, their museum. And it is an amazing book. Uh, my daughter, I got to tell you, as soon as this came in, my 12-year-old daughter said, Daddy, is that for me or is that for you? <laughs> and uh, I said, it's for everyone. We're all going to share us, it. For yeah. us, that was a really fun way to collect a lot of the artists, make, makers, and tinkers who we've worked with over the past uh, few years of these experiments here in the Tinkering Studio, and also give people some starting points or some inspiration for figuring out how they can start engaging in these same sorts of processes. So it's a yeah. labor of love from, from <laughs> us and the rest of the team here at the, here at the Tinkering Studio. So, so uh, Ryan and Nicole, I want to uh, get you introducing us to the, the work that you're doing, just kind of a brief overview. But for those of you who want to jump over right now, sort of multitask, uh, you can visit the website at uh, actually at the artoftinkering.com, artoftinkering.com, and also exploratorium.com, and that's E X P L O R A T O R I U M. Did I say and, dot com is dot edu? Yeah. And just to throw one more at you, um, tinkering.exploratorium.edu is the website based on the group that me and Nicole work with, and it's the, the part of the website that's most directly related to the things we'll be talking about today. Awesome. Cool. We can awesome. put all the links in the uh, description. Cool. The Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, and, and so uh, in the world of winning the, the best background this evening, it is you guys because you've got <laughs> a drill press right behind you. I'm going to have to uh, bring my A game next time we talk. So, so Ron and Nicole, tell us about 
what is the work that you're doing for the rest of the world out there? What is your daily life like, and what's going on at, at your... Oh, look at that. No <laughs> <one there. laughs> Does that answer? <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. You're rubbing it in now. <laughs> So I thought that I thought we could just introduce ourselves, and then I just prepared a few quick pictures of our space inside the museum. If people haven't had the chance to come here, and so I'd like to just do a quick overview of that, and then we'll move into more talking about the programs we're doing and how we've been thinking about making making. But maybe mm -hmm. Nicole, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Nicole uh, Catcheret, and I work in the Tinkering Studio the Exploratorium. My background is not in science. I definitely come from the art side, um, but I've really gotten, you know, involved with all kinds of new ideas here and gotten to play around with stuff. Like I never played around with circuits or makey makey or programming or anything like that until I came to the Tinkering Studio, um, and I've developed a great love for it, among other things. Um, but yeah, so my job here is usually involves building things that help with tinkering. So that could be working on the environment, or making tools, or weird examples to get people inspired. Mm. And I'm Ryan, and I work in the Tinkering Group with um, the team of, of artists and makers here. And I spend some of my time thinking about new activities or working with artists to get inspiration from them. And I also spend some of my time training our high school uh, explainers, who are the floor staff who facilitate activities in the, um, in the learning studio. So some of my time with kids who come into the museum, but then also working on training the staff a little bit. Awesome. Well, so uh, we're recording this, and we're going to be um, creating a catalog of these types of interviews. So uh, our audience, the way I look at it, um, either live right now or the people who will view this in the future, are educators of all kinds, and they may be classroom educators or after school or out of school educators who are intent on exploring the world of STEM or STEAM education. So we're, we're a little bit preaching to the choir uh, for as far as people who, uh, I think if they were going to sit down and watch this, that they already know on some level that this is important work. And I'm hoping that what you can point us to is maybe some uh, things that you've learned at, as far as working with professionals and also working with kids, frankly, about why this is important and, and then maybe also uh, help us understand where the makey-makey fits into this as well as some of the other technology that you use. Sure. Well, so let me, if it's okay, I'll start just by uh, sharing my screen and, and um, just going through a few photos of what our space is like here uh, beyond the drill press at the Exploratorium. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is our building at the Exploratorium. It, can you see this okay, Tom? Actually, it, it, it flipped back to your screen. We can see you now. Okay, let me try. Does that work? Still not? Uh, not yet. It okay. was up a moment ago. Okay, let me try one more time. All right. Um, now are you getting it? Yeah, we're, we're able to, I can see the inside of the Exploratorium, yes. So just wanted to go through real quick. Um, this is, oops, now it's going to go through. So this is the Exploratorium. Um, it's a, a, a new building. We've been here for about three years um, on Pier 15. So we're on the waterfront of uh, the San Francisco Bay. And uh, I said it was a new building. It's new for us. It's actually an old renovated pier. And we spent uh, a lot of time and energy taking that over uh, and populating it with um, exhibits and experiences for people to, to play with and interact with. Part of the history of the Exploratorium is to have the machine shop, so the place where um, exhibit developers are building exhibits, fixing things, repairing them, and designing uh, all of the exhibits at the museum, open, on display, accessible for people to uh, smell the grease of the of the tools and, and talk to some of the people who are uh, engaged in tinkering and making um, as their job here at the museum. So this nice. is the view. This is the view from a visitor walking through the museum. There's just a low wall, and you can look right into the shop. I so right, it. right across from that, uh, we just we placed a, a tinkering studio. So this is our workshop 
where we want to encourage visitors to go through the same type of process that the artists and makers and exhibit designers here at the museum go through, using tools, testing out ideas, experimenting with interesting problems. So there's a kind of a really neat um, interplay between those spaces in the museum. Um, we have some experiences. This is a, a, an area where kind of an introductory experience where kids can build uh, marble runs out of common materials from hardware store. So this is a, a type of area of the museum that's a little bit more uh, loose parts and open-ended than some of the exhibits, but it's not a fully um, facilitated workshop experience. And that's right across from this entrance to the Tinkering Studio, which uh, where visitors can um, participate in workshops with Makey Makey, with technologies, with other tools and materials. Uh, it kind of in this area behind this wall made out of cardboard tubes. And just, just like the machine shop, we have like a little low wall, so even if you're outside of that making space, you can watch what's happening. Mm. So, so in this picture, it's set up with, with computers, experimenting with, um, I think, Makey Makey and Scratch uh, early, in, early before visitors started working. Some of the other things we've, we've done in the space are building uh, art bots with uh, vibrating motors. So these scribbling machines have an offset weight, and they move around the table. And people spend a lot of time adjusting the parts, figuring out you know, how much of a vibration uh, to give it, trying to actually connect all the pieces together until they make something that creates a pattern or, or, or a piece of art that's interesting to them and that and has kind of matches what their goals and, um, and wishes were for, for how it would how it would look and how it would behave. Wow. <laughs> so um, we've also have been experimenting with some technologies and, and some tools. So we have a stop motion um, animation station, another exhibit that's kind of across the way from the workshop. So other ways that people can get involved. We talk a little. We'll talk a little bit later about kind of having multiple entry points and different ways for people to um, engage in uh, in tinkering for short time and longer uh, dedicated workshops. Um, we also host adult events, so this was a, a tinkering social club, a, a night event where adults came in, and in this one we were doing um, dissections. So we were cutting, or we were uh, taking apart a, a Hammond organ here in the foreground, looking at all the parts and, and seeing what um, was inside, what we could reuse, and how we can really investigate how things work. And, and I think something that Makey Makey really helps with is this you know, the world is knowable and it's something that you can understand. That's the sort of philosophy that we're trying to engage people with here in the Tinkering Studio space. And just a couple other things, um, you know, people work with us for an hour, maybe two, but we want to encourage them to keep trying things when they go home. So Nicole actually uh, hacked a vending machine and turned that into a, a place where people could buy uh, tinkering parts at cost to continue these exper experiments when they go back home. And what, uh, what would be found in there? Oh, um, so it's it's those those kind of we did some different experiments and uh, found that the things people really want are those hard hard to find kind of weird elements that if you're like a kid or just like a regular person they're like you don't know where to go get like tiny surface mount LEDs or uh, another. Yeah. One conductive thread, um, there's also some copper tape and coin cell batteries, and then there's also um, a few like little starter kits that have like a variety of, of materials. I think the most expensive thing is like five dollars. Which is good because it only takes one dollar bills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anything more than that becomes a little tedious. That's old school. No credit card. <laughs> so just kind of um, walking around here, oh I have to show this. We have artists who come um, and work with us and inspire us. This is Scott Weaver, who spent 40 years of his life making a toothpick sculpture of San Francisco. And you know, we we showcase these makers and tinkers. You know, not so much to you know have people be in awe of them or or kind of say, wow, that you know, what an amazing thing. Although it is amazing, but really more being engaged in that process of tinkering and making, yeah. and and get to know people and ask them questions and um, begin to see that 
you know, an artist or a maker or a tinker is not so different than anyone else in the world. They just had an idea and they and they practiced and they tried and and they kept going. Some people uh, more than, more than others. Yeah, and some some of the artists uh, use all kinds of different things, but you know, some of them use technology. Uh, Scott uses toothpicks and Elmer's glue, but there's a really wide range to make it really accessible to people. Yeah, I, and I just want to point out to folks who are listening is that this this idea of accessibility uh, and that the world of making and tinkering is is not assigned to special people. That <laughs> this this is a a, a place where makey makey and and the tinkering studio. Our, our philosophy is in alignment in that we we believe that this is something that everybody can do and probably if they're given an opportunity would really enjoy doing it. And I think that goes back to the beginning ideas of the Exploratorium. You, know, you talked about a science museum or an art museum. We consider ourselves to be both and I think both of those are things that you know, you don't have to be a scientist to do science. You don't have to be an artist to do art. These are ways of exploring and, and, and being in the world and, and yeah. learning new things. Mm. And we really want to encourage um, all, yeah, all, all people who come, or all people to engage in these sorts of things. And I'm just going to show a, a few shots to get a sense of our R&D space, where me and Nicole are sitting right now. This is also uh, not a low wall, but but big glass windows and transparent to have people who are in the museum see our workshop and our space where we lead uh, uh, workshops for staff and for other teachers or uh, educators, librarians, after school professionals, so art residencies, and and we also host artists uh, in in this space. So to share ideas and to try to figure out what are some different ways that we can take um, a new technology, a new material, a new technique, and uh, try it out with visitors who are coming to the museum. Yeah, and, and, and we'll show a, a real blast from the past uh, a little bit later. Um, and then just, you know, again, this idea of having lots of materials and lots of different things around the space um, because you never know what sorts of things are going to be the inspiring uh, objects that are going to help you take your project uh, in a different direction, you know, help you accomplish your goal, um, kind of take that to the next level. So that's kind of a quick, sort of quick overview of the, the learning studio in spa and space. I wonder if, if, Tom, you have questions on that or if others... Yeah, yeah, I do have some questions. So um, I, I want to... Uh, jump into uh, how the Makey Makey in particular fits into your way of looking at the world. And we're getting a sense of that. I think that folks looking at those slides are, are getting a sense of, of some of how you operate, in the, at least at the, at, at the Exploratorium. But help us understand uh, more concretely if someone, you know, is using the makey makey. Why is that important? And why would a teacher who doesn't have uh, access to all the amazing resources that you do, how does that fit into the constellation of what you're doing in the world? Yeah. So I think I think we can we can approach that in a, in a few different ways. I think one of the most uh, important is this idea of play as a way to engage in art and science. You know, we've been talking about everyone can be an artist, everyone can be a maker, everyone can be a scientist. People don't always feel that about themselves or have the confidence um, to engage in these activities. And we found having things that are whimsical, delightful, playful, unusual, that's a real way of getting people involved. And so I think seeing a Makey Makey, seeing a, a banana that turns into piano, or an interactive, you know, way of turning your staircase uh, into a, into an art installation, um, playing a video game with Play-Doh. You know, these are all playful ways where you are then experiment experimenting with technology, science, and and, and art. So, so, so help us understand the importance of play. I, I mean, you've you've mentioned that. I get. See, here's the cool thing: is that you guys. Uh, I can tell, having spoken with you before, is that you love your work and the uh, things that you do and, and bringing a smile to people's faces. Why is that important 
as we explore this world. Not that, I mean, I guess the antithesis is, is people are just see it as drudgery. But um, what, what does play allow, us, uh, allow a learner to do in your estimation? Um, I, I mean, play is huge. Like we, we, gosh, like we almost always try and engage people in a, like a, a playful way where things are really open-ended. Maybe you're trying something really silly. I feel like it takes a lot of the pressure off of someone to do something right or to like have the right answer when like you're playing around, you're experimenting. And um, another part of the play is that it tends to be a really social thing. So that's another great way to like explore an idea with like a group of people in a very like open, you know, uh, collaborative way. <laughs> well, well the, here, here's why I asked this is because <laughs> I suspect having been a classroom teacher and worked with a lot of classroom teachers, and administrators is that sometimes play looks like you're not really studying or learning. So when you talk with educators, how do you make the case for, yeah, this is important. This is this is how you do this work. Yeah, I mean, I think the other way of framing that question that uh, we've heard a lot is, you know, this looks like fun, but what are they learning? Or it looks <laughs> like fun, but are they learning? And I yeah, think. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a really important thing to address because if you're looking at this on the outside of that two ball, you know, what do you see? You see people laughing. You see people talking to each other. You see, um, you know, a mess and different materials. So I think we definitely try to train ourselves and teachers to kind of zoom into those moments and see how within this playful environment that might make it easier for people to get started that there are really um, powerful learning learning going on. And I think that that can be in, in a few different ways. I think that can be um, based on attitudes. So the fact that somebody really persists through a problem and, you know, wants to make their, um, you know, their scribbling machine work right. You know, the fact that, that there's a fun aspect of it, I think is going to help them go the extra mile and really work out a problem. You know, they're not, you know, it's, it's harder to give up something when it's, you're in this playful environment and it, it's, it's a fun experience to be doing it. I think that the social element of it, so people kind of figuring out that we can learn from each other, we can share information, you know, you don't have to wait for the teacher to tell you the information, but that you can be inspired by other people and examples around. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think and then I think the, the, you know, we are always doing activities that are engaging with science, some sort of scientific content. Um, you know, with Makey Makey, I think, you know, there's, pick, pick which one you'd like, you, you'd like to say, I mean, in terms of uh, computing, in terms of uh, electricity, circuitry, um, you know, materials and, and conductivity. You know, so there's always this element of, um, a grounding in some scientific phenomena, but the thing that, that we're trying to do through these playful investigations is not direct the content outcome of what someone comes away with learning. So we really feel that the most powerful learning happens when people are in charge of uh, their own questions, their own solutions, and their own uh, strategies for figuring out how to get from one to the other. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, the, uh, the reason I just want to point this out is because uh, for many educators, I'll give you an example. My wife and I met when we were both high school teachers. She taught chemistry. So when you think of the lab in the chemistry lab, you don't think playful, joyful uh, uh, type of environment. You, you uh, At least for me, anyway, I think of you know, note taking and studying and seriousness, right? And and that is the path to real learning. And I, I don't believe that, but I, I just want to contrast that 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 this uh, what I hear you saying is that this is very purposeful uh, in that in your approach. And I think that's right. And I think as well, you know, we're not saying that tinkering is is the only way to learn or necessarily the best way to learn. Uh, we happen to, you know, love it and, and be really engaged in, in this process. But there's, you know, there's plenty of ways you can learn from reading a book or from hearing a lecture or from, from being a part of lab, a lab and following those, those steps. 
But if you miss that excitement, that play, that level of fun, which is often absent from a lot of both formal and informal education settings, you know, you you lose out on on a, a lot of the kids who that is the way that they are going to get invested and interested in learning more about about these ideas. Well, uh, so so um, one of the things I've learned in talking with you guys already previous to this is I could probably talk with you for three or four hours nonstop, um, and uh, uh, for this. Call. I'm. I'm curious if you could share uh, uh, one or two of your favorite uses of the makey makey, and and why it's how it how that lesson fits into the where else you take the learning. Because I know, for example, uh, on your website, on the uh, Tinkering Studio website, you have your own um, blog rather for the Tinkering Studio. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is that there was one where you uh, a post on just switches that were involved with the makey makey. Is, is am I remembering that correctly? Yeah. Um, so we we've, we've done a lot of experiments with circuits um, in the tinkering studio and giving you know we have activities where people can like explore them in different ways. And one thing that's that we really love is uh, making homemade switches. Uh -huh. So instead of using like a light switch or something that you, you know, you actually you figure out how to make your own, which can be this really rich and playful experience. And also, I feel like you end up with a lot more information and knowledge about what a switch is and how it works. Um, so yeah, so we have we have a video of a wide variety of homemade switches. But that's one of the great uh, things about Makey Makey is it lets you combine making your own switches with like you know a digital thing and so you can have this like high low tech where you're using tin foil or bananas and like a computer it's like <laughs> it's, it's like we love anything where you get to combine something um, we find like whenever you're you're encountering something kind of new or unfamiliar or maybe intimidating like programming or circuits if you can combine that with something that is really familiar and yeah. accessible and something that anybody coming up to the table is going to recognize something on there and feel like I know how that works. It can help really bridge that gap and also make it open up that playful space where you're combining, you know, using familiar materials in surprising ways or, um, you know, ex combining like high and low tech and yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so what happens when you do that? Like when you when you see people making a switch, um, and, and maybe you can give us an example. Like, do you do you, when you lead a, a workshop? And again, I'm thinking of a a classroom teacher or someone in after school who's, you know, getting some cardboard together and some tin foil and other things. What is it that you're? Um, how do you set that up? Do you say make any switch you want, or do you take them from like? Here's what the basic concept of a switch is. Uh, I mean, so there's a lot of different activities where we use circuits and switches. Um, one of my favorites is chain reaction, where mm -hmm. we build these collaborative chain reactions, and they use, um, you know, like toy mechanisms and motors, and then we give people things like tin foil, so that if you connect two pieces of tin foil, it'll make your switch. And Ryan does a great thing where he'll start it out by like taking a piece of tin foil that's connecting a circuit and then just tear the tin foil in half and you see the circuit stop and it stops moving and it's this really like um, <laughs> it's this like aha moment that that you can give people um, and it's a good starting point for them and seeing and then oh look if you touch them back together again it turns on and then from there it's it really opens up a lot of paths of I exploration. I think it's definitely important to recognize that there's something very different from learning about switches or about circuitry or electronics in a in a textbook and then actually having to build your own circuit whether that's you know with a, a light bulb and a battery and a piece of tin foil or whether it's connecting something onto a makey makey you know for me one of the most powerful um, experience I had training uh, working with teachers is we we usually we, we don't do a lot of explanation in the beginning We'll, we'll put out some materials um, and, and offer some prompts with circuits we might start with, with can you turn on a light bulb, 
you know, can you add a switch into the system? Can you power two things? Can you make the light bulb so bright it um, explodes? <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, and, and and through that, you know, it's it's um, people people progress. At, at the level that that they that is appropriate for them or that is is needed for them, so that uh, you know a four year old girl might, for the first time, want you know connect a switch and and, and see the see a light you know and, and you know her 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 parent um, who's a electrical engineer you know she might uh, experiment experiment with a a, a double pole double throw switch. And turning multiple things on and off, and so they're experimenting with the same idea, but in um, you know kind of different you know different levels based on their previous experience. But the one the one I was going to say is that um, I, I I always think about uh, working with teachers, and uh, we we're you know experimenting with with buzzers and batteries and 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 light bulbs, and you know she drew a picture, you know that looks like this of. You know, like I know a parallel circuit. It, it it's you know these lines and these circles, and, and it's the diagram <laughs> you would see. Um, but you know, she she was asking, you know, how do you, you know, how, how do I do this with with wires and bolts? You know, how do I go from yeah this concept representation yeah, concept that you've seen to uh, a, a a real a real life working working circuit? And I think, you know, that ability to get your hands on some materials and, you know, connect the alligator clips to the foil, you know, th that's something that a lot of people don't get to try. Yeah. And it's, it's a totally different and, and really valuable understanding of what circuits are and how they, how they work. We're, we're strong believers in giving people time to, and materials to mess about to take ideas and to try out what they think is going to work and then see what happens and then try something else and it's and, important and I think talk, yeah, talk, and I talk, talk for a moment about that um, the time piece when it comes to educators and maybe even after school people it, do you ever receive pushback or like hey we, we've got tests to study for you know and you're, this takes time what is your response to <laughs> um, Well, I mean, just our environment on the floor is a, a drop-in environment. And so a lot of times people don't have a lot of time to spend. And that, that can be really challenging. Um, we try to scaffold things or set up the environment so that there's examples or, you know, maybe different levels of things that they can experiment with. Um, the, the best case scenario is that you can come back many times or you can stay for a really long time. And people do in our space on the floor um, will easily spend an hour like messing around with an idea when, you know, when, they, get, when they get into it and they don't want to leave. Um, but at, yeah. I think the time is a huge... It, it takes time to encounter ideas and to experiment with them and to test them and to test them again. Um, one thing we've been doing a lot of stuff with like Scratch and Makey Makey is um, it's something that people can continue doing when they leave. So we almost always have like a piece of paper with uh, links to, you know, resources that they can, mm -hmm. when they go home, they can con continue experimenting with these ideas. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we, we do really value, I mean, we say, you know, tinkering takes time. And, and like Nicole said, people working through their ideas, it's important to, you know, not, not, not rush their process. We care a lot about the process that people go through um, as learners. But I think, of course, uh, for us in the museum, for, for teachers in classrooms, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's natural that, you know, you, you don't have all the time in the world and, and there's other things to do. You know, people might... You know, need to go to the have lunch or whatever instead of continuing to work on the tinkering activity. So I think what's important for us is offering at least some time for uh, a reflection and people to share um, where they are at the moment and what they're thinking about doing next. And you know, that's a little bit harder for us just with you know visitors who we're meeting for the first time in the museum. 
but I think that's something that we really encourage and, and is, is a great opportunity that teachers and educators have to do. You know, even if there's a short time to exper experiment with Makey Makey or experiment with switches or circuits, you know, to, to build on that and to, and to not do that to get to a certain point, but to do that so that people are able to uh, express to each other what they're thinking about, what questions they have, um, you know, what, what they want to exper experiment with next time. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, uh, what are, so, so time is a challenge for many, regardless of the environment that they're teaching in. What, what are some of the other challenges that you have as educators um, and, and, and what, other, what, what are challenges that you've heard from other like teachers or after school staff when they start to uh, head down this path and say, yes, yes, I, I'm interested in STEM or tinkering. Um, what, what do they report to you in saying, uh, you know what, here's sort of boots on the ground. This is what I have to deal with. And and what do you, how do you advise them? Yeah, I mean, I'll give first. Yeah, so I mean, I think for us, we encourage um, educators who we're working with to also be engaged in the process of tinkering themselves uh, yeah. as much as they can. So, um, it, so that as you're beginning to introduce tinkering to the class, you should, we also encourage people to think about. How how the tables are arranged, you know, and, and there isn't one perfect way to do it, but it's a great thing for for a teacher or, or, or a librarian to be thinking. Oh, what if what if everyone's working at the same table? What does that get me? What if two, you know there's pods all around and people can walk around? What if the materials are in the middle? What if the materials are on each table? And and to really be huh. able to test out and prototype things and and reflect with a with a trusted friend or colleague someone else who is there at the moment uh, to think about. And we, we think we talk a lot about um, uh, facilitation as, mm -hmm. as what we're doing. You know, uh, instead of uh, t teaching or delivering content, we're really uh, facilitators or co-learners. Yes. Or people who are engaged in this conversation with um, the materials and the tools and the projects. And I think that just as you might experiment with the environment, we really encourage teachers to exper experiment with their facilitation strategy. You know, what works well with one kid might not work well with someone else. So I think for us, the biggest challenge is people thinking, okay, um, you know, I have uh, a Makey Makey, or I have, you know, all the parts to make a scribbling machine, and I'm ready to go. And, you know, like, it, it will just take care of itself. And in fact, we found that with these activities and with these tools and technologies that once you have the pieces, once you have the, the project or the activity, that's just the first step yes. for you to engage in that process of and trying new things and testing things out. I think it's also really important to find some thinking partners and some people that you can experiment with, like other educators, uh, you know, your family, your friends like to try out ideas and mm. to reflect on to reflect on it. There's also lots of online resources like this is I think <laughs> going to be a great one. Um, there's also there's a community of practice that uh, we can give a link to that's a good resource for people who are trying to do this stuff in their environments to share ideas and questions. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a whole, there's a world of support. You know, it, it, you've caused me to think uh, of uh, uh, about a week ago I was leading a workshop with some educators and we were just exploring with the Makey Makey what is conductive and what is not. Mm -hmm. and, and several times I thought this was so interesting because I said, let's explore. what mm -hmm. Find things in this room that are conductive and things that are not. And several times I had teachers say, hey, Tom, is this conductive? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, let's find out. Now, I may, may have known because it was like a pen made out of plastic, and I thought, I doubt it's going to be conductive, but it. I, I think it's there's this. Um, it's a mindset of we we get into a practice of looking to somebody else to tell us rather than to explore. You know, and and to put the time into figuring out the what is known, what is unknown, and 
and uh, because it does take time, but it also takes an attitude of I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this. We also, yeah, we also try. That's totally, that's right. And we we also try to be really open and transparent about the fact that that we're experimenting and we're trying things and. Uh, maybe we don't know like what's going to happen or or where it might lead, um, and we invite people to try it with us alongside mm. us. Um, which it it reminds me. I mean, what you just triggered something, Nicole, for me is one of my favorite TED talks is by Brene Brown. She actually gave two, you know, and one I think it's her first one, mm -hmm. uh, but she she explores. She's a, a professor and talks about the power of vulnerability, and and I think that this is. As educators, if, if we're going to step into the unknown, that um, and explore and invent and and create, that we become vulnerable Absolutely. in that process, and that's a good thing. Well, and I think um, we, I think we, it, it is, it is. You are, you are kind of putting yourself out there, and it can feel scary and risky, and I think. That's another reason to, to pay even more attention to what is the environment like? Um, you know, is, is the space comfortable? Uh, does it feel like, do you have the tables all together, like Ryan said, yeah. so it's social and you can see what other people are trying? Um, do you have a nice, nice seats? Or if you can't mm -hmm. control your environment, uh, you can do a lot with facilitation mm -hmm. and really trying to make people feel welcome and comfortable. And, and that's, for me, I, where the silly, playful thing comes in. Um, it takes a lot of that pressure off and makes you feel less less vulnerable when you're like, oh, it's silly, we're playing around and like yeah, you know, yeah, we're open. And we find <laughs> we find a lot of um, I think exactly what what you're saying with the with the pen and, and it's conductive. One of the things that we love the most about tinkering and and, and trying these unusual activities is the fact that we are also learners. You know. We are every day we do, uh, you know, so one, some of these activities in the museum. We are finding new, you know, kids and adults are coming up with new solutions. They're telling us and showing us novel ways of, of using these parts. So I think, whereas, you know, like you said, the you, you might have that feeling as a as the teacher, as the person who's in charge, that. Uh, oh no! You know the pen isn't conductive. That's not what what we're wor working on right now. You know, ask like to follow that thought and to ask them questions and like, yeah. are there parts of the pen that are conductive? What what kinds of pens are there that and, might be? And and that's and that's also huge when somebody asks a question that's maybe risky, like exposing, like I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, and but also the fact that they're asking that question, they want to know. Like they want to know, like what is conductive? Is this conductive? Yeah. Like that's like like helping somebody follow that question is like that's when like learning happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I I, I want to again encourage folks to find this book, go to Amazon, and you'll read some amazing reviews about this, the art of tinkering. And we're gonna uh, Liam is gonna uh, when we post this is gonna have links. Uh, that we've talked about. So, so Ryan and Nicole, tell us sort of as as we start to wrap up this conversation. Um, when you bring in educators or, or people who are exploring this, what is your hope for them when they take a workshop um, and they're sort of new and and testing out these waters? I know that where comparatively where you live, there's way more energy around this whole idea of the maker movement and tinkering and it, uh, this type of thing, but there are parts of the country that are just now stepping into this. And, and if, if they came to your workshop, what is your hope for them as they, as they head down this path? <laughs> um, I mean, I, we probably both want to answer this one. Um, <laughs> my hope, no matter who it is, whether it's an educator or a kid, or you know who, anyone. Um, my hope is that they feel welcome. They feel like it's something that they can experiment with and explore, um, and that it's something that they're able to start getting their hands dirty and feel like it's something that like they have you know they have like the skills to like try out ideas and to experiment with new ideas. And um, it's okay to not know the answer and that you can 
pursue questions down the paths they take you. And, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, just, just to add on, um, you know, we try to give people some starting points. Um, so to build a, a scribbling machine, an art robot, or to use a tool like a Makey Makey, or to, you know, mount electrical components on wood blocks. We try to give them those experiences that you can start working on right away, and but that's that you're not finished with that. So that people have the confidence and the interest to make them their own, to dissect a toy and create a different circuit board part that we haven't seen. So I think there's this real balance between um, sharing some of the things that we found that have worked really well or that, that we think of as our best practice, but really encouraging people to make it their own and share back with us what they end up doing. You know, we usually end up learning just as much back from people later on uh, than, than, than they learn from us when they come in and do these workshops. And I think, you know, with, with, with um, any of these kind of tools for tinkering, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the, 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 the beauty of, of this is that it's open source and that it's uh, customizable and that, um, you know, we, we want everyone to tell us what your favorite Makey Makey activities yes. are <laughs> so we can try them and tweak them <laughs> and make them our own and report them back. So I think, to me, it's just adding people to that community of educators and tinkerers. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so any other thoughts before we, we wrap up? Any other ideas or suggestions or resources that you would like to make sure that we include uh, for educators? Like I know that you offer a, uh, a workshop. Is it three or four days long? Yeah, so there's, I mean, I can talk just a couple things that, that um, are from us at the Exploratorium, and then maybe there's a few, a few others that have inspired us along mm -hmm. the way. Yeah. So um, we do offer a three-day intensive workshop here at the Exploratorium where educators can come and uh, try out activities as learners, but also um, reflect on how, how those uh, ideas uh, can be a part of their practice. Um, la sure. Yeah, last summer, for the first time, uh, we attempted to do a, a, a MOOC, a massively open online course, which was a little scary for us initially. Um, you know, how can you do these hands-on tinkering activities through uh, video, you know, video uh, webinars and, and things like that? But what we found is that although you know you, we didn't have that shared experience, the message boards and the things people were were talking and sharing back and forth were super amazing and super deep. So I definitely recommend, I think, this summer um, at, at Coursera, we, we're offering a course called Tinkering Fundamentals. And mm. that's directed for educators of, of all types um, who are interested in learning more about how tinkering can be a part of uh, STEM lessons, activities, curriculum. Awesome. Um, <laughs> and. Any other ideas? <laughs> Again, this is this is the thing. If if really if people want to get uh, farther into this, is sign up for the Coursera uh, course this summer, um, and and ideally head to the Exploratorium, yeah. I, which is something that I would love to do this year. Well, I think I mean I think the other thing that's that's would be really great to to share with people is. So, so you mentioned our blog that's at you know, tinkering.exploratorium.edu, and we're just beginning to get into these ideas of programming, you know, merging the digital and physical world, uh, Makey Makey and Scratch. Yeah. And on our blog, we also are, are sharing what we're thinking about, um, the artists who are inspiring us, the things who we're trying, and, you know, that would also be a great way for people to follow along with us as we're wading into this new topic or new area that um, you were trying to see. Like, how can you approach coding, programming, sensors, input, outputs in, in, as, in as, uh, 
intuitive and playful a way as you can, you know, approach uh, pegs and marbles and tracks and blocks and dominoes. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be an experiment for us, and we still have <laughs> time to learn about lots it. Of, lots of things that work, and maybe some silly ideas that don't. Yeah. <laughs> we, we try to be very transparent. Yeah, we share both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, it, it's uh, well, it, you remind me of the famous is it Thomas Edison who was you know talking about the invention of the light bulb. You know where he, someone asked you know he. Uh, you failed a thousand times in, in creating this device. And it's like, no, no, I just learned a thousand ways how not to make a light bulb. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I might be paraphrasing, but it's this idea of, of the value of, quote, failure. You know, what, is, what does that mean, and where does it take us? Um, and, and again, it's, it's like from, from many educators, we've been trained to look for the right answer and value uh, the right answer and and with this type of work sometimes the wrong answer uh, takes us in the most amazing direction right so uh, also that maybe there's a lot of right answers <laughs> yeah there's not just one right answer there's many ways to make a switch uh, as uh, and, and we share your video by the way uh, on the this our teacher to our teachers to just say, look at all these amazing ways to make a switch. Well, and I think giving giving your students opportunities to do that, and also giving yourselves opportunities to do that as teachers, as educators. Like, let's come up with tons of makey makey workshops that aren't so great. And I think in that process, we're, we'll develop a few of them that yeah. really get at these learning outcomes that we're hoping for. Uh, Collaboration, initiative, intentionality, uh, the confidence that people can then take into in, in, into their other experiments with science and technology. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, <laughs> uh, Liam, we're uh, close to the top of the hour. Uh, do you have anything that you need to add from your end? We'll send the video. I feel, I feel like uh, I feel like you three covered it pretty well. <laughs> Uh, all we got to do is just have another three days to keep this conversation going. I have a feeling that we're going to have you back more than uh, just this time because uh, we. I yeah. feel like we just scratched the surface of all the amazing. Yeah, we've things really, we've done. And it. Yeah, go ahead. We've really got to talk about the things we've tried too because we we've, we've tried some things with Mickey Mickey that worked great and some didn't and we'll share more on the blog. But it'd be nice to have another conversation down the line. Absolutely. And it's, <laughs> And it's super special for us. I mean, we shared with Tom the other day that um, uh, Jay Silver and Eric Rosenbaum were in the tinkering studio at our old building uh, close to six years ago, wow. prototyping something called Project Q, which was this weird way of hooking a computer, uh, emulating <laughs> a keyboard, and hooking up to bananas. And that is what then turned into and become Makey Makey. So it's so... Uh, special, I think, for us to have seen this project go from the very beginning and continue to see where it will go. So we'll post, uh, we'll send you guys the video of us uh, in 2010 uh, with the the we first sort throwback of Thursday. Throwback oh, that would be awesome! Yeah, totally. Well, that probably became the Dradio and then the Makey Makey, right? And I think, and I think, <laughs> I think that video will, will give it a good sense of the work we do behind the scenes here, like prototyping activities and like working with artists and <laughs> trying out ideas that are kind of half baked. So <laughs> this is what art we love to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, very good. Thank. I really want to thank you for your time and your energy and the work that you're doing out in the world. It's an inspiration to me, and uh, I can't wait to make sure that the rest of the world knows about what you're doing uh, as we go about helping the world understand the value of invention literacy, uh, you know, just as we, we value number literacy and uh, language and, and uh, literacy, we think that invention literacy is, as, uh, is the new way to look at the world and understand the world. Those people who are literate uh, in this arena will have an edge where other people, it's, it would be no different than not being able to read. You know, it's like those people who can't read, or it, the world is harder for them. So we want to 
We want to help all kids get to that place where they are in invention literate. Well, uh, I'll, well, I'm sure we'll be back again at, okay. at some point. And uh, until then, I really uh, want to say again thanks and look forward to. I'll, we'll send you a link when this posts, and uh, Liam will help help get the links out to everybody else uh, that are associated that we mentioned in here. So, all right, yeah. well, and, Liam. And thanks. Just yeah, say thanks. thanks so much for having us. Yeah. And like I think you said originally, but. Please come by the Exploratorium and come to the Tinkery Studio and say hi to us. Uh, so, like some of the greatest conversations, people, um, you know, just getting to know each other. So, if you're in San Francisco, stop by and knock on our big glass window and. and say hi to <laughs> just for everybody. Cool. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Nicole and Ryan. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Till next time. Good night. Good night.